Good morning, Real Life Ministries. We are so excited that you are joining us online this morning. We hope that you are having a fabulous summer. July is finally here and the warm weather has at least reached North Idaho. So we are super grateful. We are just enjoying the outside, the lakes, the parks, all the things. But before we get started, I'd love to know where you're watching from. Drop that in the chat. Don't forget we have staff and volunteers online ready to uh, answer any questions you might have, uh, pray with you. So again, drop those in the chat or you can email us at info at reallifeministries.com. And again, we know that summer can be a crazy time. I know my family has been going on some vacations um, and everyone's kind of traveling, school's out. And so we want you to stay connected though all throughout the week. So make sure you have our app downloaded and ready to go. That way, if we have an upcoming event coming up, um, you can add it straight to your calendar right from our event page on our app. It's gonna have our sermon series, a place to give, all the things that you want to know are gonna be right on the app. So make sure it's downloaded. If you don't have it, download it. And we also wanna make sure that you're staying connected to church in person. And what's great about our real life campus up here in North Idaho is that we actually have four campuses. We have our Post Falls campus, that's where I'm at right now, along with our North campus, our Coeur d'Alene campus, and our Hayden campus. So we have tr uh, some services on Thursday evening, some services on Sunday evening, and obviously Sunday morning, so again, Make sure that you're connecting with us in person. You can check out our website, reallifeministries.com backslash new and even schedule a visit and come in and meet some of our staff, take a tour of our campuses. Again, we love getting to connect with you guys all the time. And sometimes the summer is the perfect time to do it, especially if you're traveling from out of town and you watch from a distance and you're gonna be here, come introduce yourself to us. We wanna know who you are and where you're watching from because we are grateful for you guys. But we are continuing in our sermon series, But I Tell You, and Jim Putman's back. He's actually been in Uganda uh, just helping different church leaders over there. And we are excited, though, to have him safe and home with us. And I'm excited to hear what he has he's going to be speaking on this morning. I know it's going to be incredible. One last thing though, before we um, wrap this up and we get ready to worship together, we do have our new groups barbecue. I know we talked about it last week, but we're going to keep talking about it because again, we want to be connected. We are not supposed to be doing life alone. And so if you have been wondering, man, how do I get connected at real life? I'm nervous. I don't know these people. New Groups Barbecue is the best way for you to answer, uh, ask questions, um, maybe meet some new people, again, meet some of our staff, and just kind of take that first little step into connection. So that's going to be July 26th is on a Tuesday. It's going to be in our brand new pavilion outside on the lawn. You are not going to want to miss it. We're going to have great food, bounce houses, games. It's going to be an awesome night. So again, check out the website or the app for all those details. But I am excited. So excited to get to worship together. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you guys later.
once again. Would you guys stand with us and pray as we prepare our hearts to magnify the Lord together. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning to set aside all of the distractions, to place our gaze firmly on you, to know that you are the one that we're here for, to magnify your name, to know that we are transformed in your presence, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. And right now, Jesus, we just declare we love you, we acknowledge you in this place, and we celebrate your name together. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. says that if we won't praise him, the rocks will cry out. But we're not going to let that happen this morning, are we? Let's sing who else. Who else would rocks cry out to worship? His glory time starts to shine. Perhaps 
Right. Man, what powerful truths to be able to lift up this morning as we worship. It's good to be together, isn't it? What a gift to be able to, to gather and worship. I want to welcome you. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're just so excited for what God's going to do today. How you doing in real life? How's your summer? Good? You guys looking forward to triple digit weather this week? Yeah? No complaining after the spring we had, right? We we're grateful for the hot weather. Hey, we especially want to know that you're here, especially through the summer. 
As it's warm outside, we'd love for you to take a second to get out your phone and text in the word here. That'd be amazing. Uh, to know that you're here with us, especially when someone's not with us, it's important. We care for this church. We want to shepherd this church. And if you're online, we want to say welcome. Thanks for joining us online. Even if you can't be here physically, if you would text the word online to the number that you see there on your screen, it'd be amazing for you to do that. And especially if you are new with us, we want to welcome you. Say thanks for being here. If you would text NEW to that number that you see, that would be a great way for us to find out more about who you are and help you take next steps to get connected in this big place called Real Life. We're just, again, really grateful that you took that step to be here, that courageous step. For all of us that are a regular part of Real Life, can we welcome our guests right now? So excited that you're here. I have one more courageous next step if you're new. If you would uh, walk across the lobby after service, we have an information area. You can't miss it. The text is massive. Information. Uh, we'd love to give you a gift. We have a, a real life journal for you. We'd love to just shake your hand. And this is just be a, a tool for you as you kind of start your connection here. We want to help you grow in your faith with, with God and be able to take that next step. So we'd love to meet you after service at the information area. Again, thanks for being here. For those of you that are a part of Real Life, we're going to move into our time right now of giving of our tithes and offerings, which is a moment that we set aside every week just to pause and, and to say, God, everything we have is yours. And even look at everything that God has given us and say, God, we're grateful because it really is all yours. It's, it's yours. We're stewards of, of everything you've given us. Uh, you can give on our website, reallifeministries.com slash give. Uh, on our app, we have a give button or our boxes all around campus for check and cash. But this is a way for us to trust God in everything we have and say, God, we want to build your kingdom. We want to point to you. And God is doing just amazing things in our midst. We're going to celebrate a whole bunch of different things coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, God's doing things locally, nationally, internationally. Jim's going to share a little bit about his trip to Uganda. But again, God is doing amazing things through your generosity, through your serving, through your testimonies, your stories. So again, thank you for, we're a generous church. We want to build God's kingdom, not our own. Hey, we got one thing I want to tell you about coming up this week uh, is our, if you're newer to the church, newer to the church, and looking to get connected relationally, looking for a small group. We're a church of small groups. We, we believe that we grow in relationship. That's how God shapes us as disciples. And we're looking for uh, people to get connected as we move into the fall. And it's coming, it's sad to even talk about it. But looking ahead, we have ways to connect and being in a small group is so important and vital. We have a new group's barbecue out at the new pavilion outside uh, coming up Tuesday night. We're gonna have a barbecue, there will be shade, so it's gonna be nice out there. Uh, we're gonna have a chance to meet some of our existing small groups and hear about upcoming new small groups that are launching. We'd love to invite you to that, just show up. Uh, we have um, food provided. It's going to be an awesome time hearing from our, our group's team, meet some staff, meet some volunteers, and get connected because we're better in relationship. We need to grow in relationships. So I'd love to invite you to that. Hey, well, we're so excited for what God's doing. We actually get to celebrate right now. We get to be a part of a baptism in our service. Come on, we can celebrate that. God is changing lives every single week, and we get to be a part of the story. Here's what baptism is. Baptism is a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. Death to the old self and life in Christ. It's, a, it's a really a statement to say before God, I'm committing, and there's a lot of you today, to stand before all of you and commit to, to Christ publicly. All right, here we go. Let's do this. Brittany, who do we got? Good morning. My name is Brittany. I'm one of the ministry leads uh, here on the youth team. And this morning we have Taylor. We actually just got back from a week of summer camp, which was really amazing, and God did a lot of awesome things in Taylor's life. Uh, she decided to commit her life to the Lord, which is so great. So Taylor's here with her parents, her small group leader, her friends, her grandma, people here that are just in her circle, investing in her and pouring into her, and it's just, uh, this is awesome. They're part of your journey. Are you ready? Okay, Taylor, a few questions for you. Do you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? And that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again three days later? And are you placing him as your personal Lord and Savior? Awesome. Okay, it's upon those confessions. I'm going to have you plug your nose, and we're going to baptize you together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Woo! Yay! 
decisions from camp. It's just amazing to watch. And again, we're a part of that. Praying for every one of us today that we take a next step in our faith. We've got Jim back in the country, back in the house today preaching. Can't wait to hear from him. He's a little tired, a little jet lag. We're gonna hear, he's doing great though. Let's pray for him and for us. God, right now, we just set aside this time to hear from you, that you would speak to us. God, that you would be with Jim as he brings a word he's been excited to share and just pray today that you would be changing lives as we know you do every single week. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Well, I have been the last couple, two and a half weeks on one mission trip or another. Uh, two weeks ago, I was with uh, our, I call it a missions trip because I'm so old I don't fit in there. Uh, I was at high school camp and um, what, what an amazing time it was. It reminds me of my youth ministry days and it makes me want to go back to youth ministry uh, kids are just as jacked up as adults. They just accept it. Adults, they're just too smart. Um, no, I, I just love it. All of you who have given so that we could sponsor kids to go to camp, all of you folks who took time off, the, the, the leaders, many of them took vacation time to go and work with high school kids and junior high kids and children's ministry folks. I mean, we've had camp after camp. So many decisions for Christ, and uh, boy, for those of you who sponsored kids or went and served at camp, we just love you. We are so appreciative of you. And then I, I got back from there, and I flew to Uganda, and uh, uh, you may not know this, but that's another place where a real life has been invested for years, for 10 years. Uh, we're in 34 different countries, but for 10 years in particular, our, uh, one of our, our families, uh, Paul and Stephanie Burns, is, uh, who's on staff, and then Dave and Janelle Campbell have been working there in Uganda. And I mean, since they got there, there's now 34 church plants out of that one church, and there's a clinic, and they're feeding 500 orphans, coupled them with, uh, with uh, um, women who have lost their spouses, and then they bought land so they could grow food and feed themselves and cattle. And many of you have been involved in all of that. And it's spreading through Uganda. And we got to go with Compassion International and start working with some of their churches there on discipleship. And man, what a, what a whirlwind trip, but what a blessing. Uh, so just so you know, um, I'm completely backwards in my time. And so I have no idea how long I'm going to go. In Africa, if it's a two-hour service, they go, why'd we get out so early? Uh, yeah, you're not like, I know. <laughs> We're in a series right now, and uh, one, one last thing, I, I, let me just say this. Next Friday night, we have what's called our Align event, and that's for all of our volunteers that have volunteered in all kinds of different ministries, our leaders in our church. And we come together from five to seven on Friday. There's child care provided. be all kinds of fun stuff for kids. But you get to hear about what God has done in the last year, what he's going to do. It's a big time to get together and celebrate and, and hang out together. So if you're a volunteer or leader, next Friday night, come and, and find out what God's been doing and where he's going in this next year. We share it with you first. And, and uh, again, just a, a time to honor those who have served so well in this last year. So that's this coming Friday night. I hope you'll make time to be there. We are in a series right now called But I Say, and it's really uh, looking through the different times where Jesus would contrast what the culture was believing with the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, Christianity is absolutely exclusive. What that means is that there is one way to salvation. There is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. That's quite a statement that's made over and over and over again in the scriptures. But what makes Christianity unique is that the one who said I'm the way, the truth, and the life, 
and no one comes to the Father except through me, did something unique in all of history that nobody else was able to do. He, he did and said things that are unlike anybody else. And we live in a culture that, that kind of says, hey, truth isn't objective, it's subjective. You've got your truth, I've got my truth. You've got your own version of the faith, I've got my own version of the faith. And, and to God, it really doesn't matter. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not what he claims. People who say that haven't read the scriptures. And, um, and so in this series, we've been looking at these different ways Jesus views the world. And if you've given your life to Jesus, um, you, baptism is a picture of that. We've already had, I, I don't know, a bunch this weekend. But it's a picture of a statement you're making, of a, of a change of heart and mind that you're making. You're just making a public declaration. It's commanded that you're to do it. If you haven't done it, you need to do it. But there, it's not just an event. It's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a flagpole so just stuck in the ground that says, uh, a stake in the ground that says, I, there's a change in me. I'm moving from the way I used to see the world based on my culture, my friend group, my, my, uh, my family, my schooling. No, I'm now, I've come to the place where I believe Jesus is the son of the living God and I'm dying to that old life and that old way of seeing things, being raised to walk in newness of life, a new life. Baptism is a picture of cleansing. Our sins are washed away and we're, we're new in Christ and, and so, I'm now going to start going through this process of moving from a worldly perspective to God's perspective, as revealed in his word. And so I know we live in a culture that 69% of Americans claim that they're Christian. Um, I was just in Uganda, 84% claim to be Christian. But what they claim and how they live are completely contradictory, the same as in the United States. Um, you know, witchcraft everywhere, sexual immorality, abuse, all of this, uh, you know, attending church every so often, you know, but it, it is anything but godly or Christ-like. And uh, it's the same in America. Those who claim to be Christian versus who God says are Christian there's a, there's a wide gap between those two. Jesus himself said, wide is the road that leads to destruction and many there will be who will find it, but narrow is the road that leads to salvation and few there will be who will find it. And so what does the Bible say? This, today we're gonna look at the word faith. And again, we live in a culture that um, uh, faith is whatever we want it to be. It's like this kind of a personal contract we have with, uh, with God oftentimes that says, well, I like this and you like, let's just come to the middle and let's kind of agree. And, and I mean, that's bad enough, but most people are like, hey, it, God, I want to invite you into my life and it's going to be my way and you're just going to help me get my way. And so those two views are completely contrary to what Jesus actually said. And so we're going to walk through what the Bible says about faith today. And we're gonna look at, at somebody who Jesus actually kind of elevated him. And it says that this guy's faith was amazing. He, he was amazed at this guy's faith. And he said he, he, all throughout Jerusalem and all throughout Israel, he hadn't seen anybody like this guy. So turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Luke 7 is another example. If you put the two passages together, it's the same story, told a little bit different way. And, uh, and so here's what uh, is going on before I dive into this. You always want to go into the context. Jesus has done all kinds of miraculous things. He's been healing people all over. And Jesus had a habit of upsetting the apple cart, kind of flipping it over, and making heroes out of people the Jews would have never made a hero out of, and then downplaying those who the Jews lifted up. Uh, the Pharisees were honored by everybody, but Jesus came and said that they were hypocrites. Uh, the, the Jews couldn't stand tax collectors and prostitutes. 
Um, and, and Jesus, or Samaritans for that matter, and Jesus often made them the hero of the story. And it wasn't that he was affirming what they were doing, it's just that from Jesus' perspective, everybody's sick, everybody's broken, everybody's fallen short of the glory of God. It's only those who recognize it and accept the, 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 the judgment of God towards their own behaviors and that seek him for mercy, those are the heroes of the story. And so if you go into this story, uh, Jesus is uh, in Matthew 8 and, and the end of 7. He's walking throughout the area and a leper comes uh, to Jesus and he's crying out to Jesus on the side of the road. Now in those days, a leper uh, would have been excluded from his community, separated, and they would have put out into what's called a, a leper colony. And just to make sure that uh, uh, these folks didn't contaminate anyone else, they used to bring food and leave it outside the camp, and then these people could come get the, the food, but they couldn't come out. And wherever they went, if there was people around, they had to say, leper, leper. And so this disease is a, is a skin disease that parts of your body would get infected and rot off. So they would, it was just disfiguring and terrible disease. Obviously, nobody wanted to get it. And so uh, these, now at the same time, back in those days, they believed that if you, uh, if you got sick in some way, it's because you must have done something wrong. If you were blind, it was your parents had sinned or you had sinned. So you can imagine these people are ostracized. Uh, they were called untouchables in, in a sense. And uh, just like they do in the, in the Hindu culture, they, just, they were outside of camp and, and excluded. Couldn't go to the temple, couldn't worship God with the other believers, and uh, they were, it was kind of their fault. It was just their fault. They did it to themselves. And Jesus didn't see it that way. And so here's this leper crying out, and uh, Jesus says, what do you want? And the man said, if you are willing, you could heal me. If you are willing, you could heal me. It's a statement of faith. He came, found Jesus. He believed he could do it. He believed that, of course, Jesus would have to be willing. Faith by itself, uh, just believing that Jesus uh, could, didn't mean that he would. God, at times, does say no. Has anybody else found that to be true? Jesus said, I am willing. And it says that he touched him. Now, don't miss that. That was probably the first time a non-leper had touched that man in who knows how long. Not only was he willing, he touched him. He put his hand on him. And uh, the man was immediately cleansed. Again, this is completely different than what the, uh, the Jews of the time would be expecting. Um, Jesus was interacting with the untouchables, with the dirty people. He had left heaven to come down to deal with human beings. And from Jesus' perspective, perspective, everybody's sick, not just that leper. And Jesus came to touch, to reform relationship. Now you go into Matthew chapter 8. And Jesus now uh, does something that's also kind of uh, mind-blowing to these folks. Let's, let's read this. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, uh, or Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Now, Luke actually clarifies that the centurion sent the elders of, of a, a Jewish town near there to come with a message from the centurion. And so um, th these guys that are going to come, uh, Luke gives us more detail, were actually Jewish elders who come on the behalf of a centurion. In Luke, it says that they said, hey, Jesus, this guy is an honorable man, and he even built a synagogue for us Jews in that town. Okay, so this guy was being honored by the Jews. Now, that by itself is a little bit unusual because the Jews felt the Romans had uh, taken their land, made them slaves, conquered them, you know, set up their high priest and set up their King Herod, and they just controlled everything. They weren't, they weren't very well liked, but the Jewish elders of a town said, hey, this guy is pretty amazing. He says this, here was it, he said, asking for help. That, so this, they come asking for the centurion 
uh, on his behalf saying, we need help. My servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from east and west and will take their places in the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Now, I want you to get a picture. Again, Jesus says, this is the kind of faith I haven't found in uh, any of, uh, of those in the kingdom, meaning the Jewish nation that had been chosen by God to represent God. And ultimately, remember, Abraham had pro been promised by God that through your seed, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So the Jews had been used by God for a long time to set up the law, to kind of explain the boundaries that God has for life and existence and, and to teach about that. But ultimately, through this pipeline of the Jewish people, the seed, the, the, the water of life would come through the pipeline and splash out into the entire world and make it possible for non-Jews to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says, this guy is unlike anybody else. Now, there's, there's several things that I could say about that. I would say um, it's possible for those who have been a part of the kingdom to become so kind of uh, used to it, so um, hardened to it, heard it too many times that it doesn't mean anything to them, and they go through the motions, but they don't really have faith anymore. It's more of a, a family sort of traditional faith they go to the ceremonies, they do that kind of stuff, but when it comes to a personal faith, it doesn't really happen for them. And at the same time, there are people who weren't brought up in the faith, who, who, who didn't um, uh, grow up in a, in a Hebrew home at the, in those days or a Christian home today, that, that they, they embrace the kingdom of heaven. They understand at a level that even those who have gone through the motions religiously don't actually uh, embrace. He says, listen, this faith that is so amazing, there's going to be guys like him, ladies like him, that uh, would never been included into the kingdom, who didn't know all that stuff, but when they heard the message, when they understood the message, it changed their life, and they're going to be sitting there in the kingdom of heaven with the patriarchs of old, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, the greats. They're going to be there when those who had the benefits of the kingdom took it for granted said, well, aren't I, aren't I a child of Abraham because I'm a part of the race? I was born into it. He says, no, no, that's not, that's not good enough. Being born into the right family, being born into the right religious faith doesn't mean you actually have a personal faith. Is this making sense to you this morning? I'm a little foggy. I could start over. I'm backwards. It's like 11 o'clock at night, my time. Jesus is making some important statements. Now he says here that this guy had amazing faith. So let's just go through. Let me show you a couple things that I think are important here. Some hints in the passage that point out what an amazing faith looks like to God. And again, listen, you might say I have an amazing faith. You might say I don't. But if God says I ha you have an amazing faith, then, then that's a pretty good statement. Wouldn't you agree? God the Son said, this guy's faith is pretty amazing. So what are some of the characteristics of this faith? Well, first, um, he had an accurate faith. 
an accurate faith, a precise faith, uh, uh, not, not a general sort of uh, ho-hum, sort of, you know, synchronistic, encompassing a bunch of different, you know, if, if, if you look through the passage of scripture, you notice a couple of things. First, you notice that he uh, built a synagogue for the Jewish people in his region. He built a synagogue. It, he would have been considered what's called a God fear. He was not a, a circumcised Jew. He was one who had come to believe in the Jewish God. And so he would have been in, there was actually the court of Gentiles in the Old Testament where the, the, the Gentiles who actually believed could go in there, but they could never go into that next level. He had, been, he had come to the place where though he was Roman, he had seen something, something had changed about him, and he realized that the Jewish God was God. And, and he knew that the Jewish God had proclaimed in the Old Testament that there was going to be one who would be the Messiah who would come. And so you see this guy have a very uh, specific understanding of, 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 uh, of truth and he had the faith that led him through the kind of the Jewish pipeline all the way to discovering that Jesus is the Messiah. And you know he believed that Jesus was special because when he says, to, when he speaks to Jesus or he sends the message to Jesus, he calls him Lord. Big L, Lord. So it wasn't just, you know, you're a good teacher. This guy came approaching Jesus, having understood that there was a Messiah, having understood these miracles were happening. This guy had been, because he had been obedient with what he knew, God revealed some things to him. And now he comes through the Jewish uh, religion to the point of the Jewish religion, the Christ. He had an accurate faith. He came to believe. Now, we don't know what other interactions he had had. We don't know what else he would have heard. But in his interaction with Jesus, Jesus said, this guy's got it right. He, he's believing in the faith. Uh, Jude, verse 3 says that, that God has given us the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith, uh, me, meaning uh, the doctrines of the faith, the truth of the faith. There is the faith that is accurate. There is a faith that is, that is built on truth, and we Christians possess it. Anything that contradicts it is outside of the lines of what has been passed down to us accurately. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the fulfilled promises of the Old Testament. Jesus is the one who, who comes for a specific purpose. He is the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. He is the Christ, the King of the kingdom, the Messiah. And so now you see he has an accurate faith. But he doesn't just have an accurate faith. He has a humble faith. He has a humble faith. A couple of things. As a Roman citizen, he could have uh, and as a centurion, a leader, he could have said, bring Jesus to me. Go and get that Jesus. He had that kind of authority in Jerusalem, in, in Israel. But notice, he understood who Jesus was, and so he, made this, he took the steps to leave where he was and go to Jesus, to send a message to Jesus, to go and say, Jesus, will you, will you, will you heal my heart? my uh, servant. Now, I want you to notice though, Jesus said, all right, let's go, I'm gonna go. And now you see a humility in this man that says, listen, Jesus, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. Now, guys, don't miss this. A Roman citizen, he would have been brought up to believe Rome and the Roman army are the, are the, and their gods and our way of doing things is right and everybody else is less. They were a conquering group of people that wanted to dominate and yet this man's faith brought him to this place where I, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. See, he understood what the Jews didn't. 
The Jews were like, hey, I'm better than that guy, and I'm better than that guy, and I'm the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and, and uh, you know, I followed the rules, and I'm glad, you know, remember the, the tax collector and the Pharisee, the Pharisee looks at the tax collector, and he says, I'm so glad, Father, that I'm not like that man over there. I follow this rule, I follow that rule, I have to, you know, and, and what do you see? You see this guy going, I- I'm not even worthy. You're the king of kings. I've fallen short. Romans 3, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah, there's none righteous, no, not one. All of us have left the paths of God to follow our own way, like sheep who have gone astray. He understood who Jesus was and the distance between Jesus and himself, even though he was a Roman, he was powerful, he had authority, he laid it all down. He had a humble faith. Jesus was the point. Jesus was the one that mattered. Well, he didn't just have a humble faith or an accurate faith. He had a courageous faith. A courageous faith. You go, well, in what sense was he courageous? Well, imagine being a Roman centurion and deciding that rather than dominate and control the Jews... He actually made a statement by building their synagogue. He actually ministered to the elders in that Jewish community. He was known for being somebody who who collaborated with and worked with and worked for. Imagine what the other proud Romans thought about this man. And then he goes and he sends messages to Jesus. And could you imagine what the Romans around him must have been thinking as he said, go and tell Jesus, I'm not even worthy for him to come into my house. See, this this Roman citizen had the courage to stand up against his own culture and his own prejudices and the opinions of others. And he said, listen, Jesus matters to me no matter who else thinks I'm foolish. No matter who else thinks I'm silly or or crazy. This Jewish community of people who have been dominated over and over again, it's not what it looks like. I'm going to follow Jesus. He had courageous faith. Well, he also had obedient faith. Obedient faith. You see his obedience as, uh, remember, the guys come to him and say, hey, this guy, he's built a synagogue for us. He's done these things. But you also see the way he's living his life. See, in the Old Testament, if you really understand the way you're supposed to live, remember, all the law and the prophets are about loving God and loving others. It's about ministering to, to those who have fallen, ministering to the widows and orphans. The Old Testament God is a God who set up parameters built around helping those that you lead not dominating over them or controlling. And so notice who this guy is and who he's asking for help about. He's saying, listen, I have a servant who is very sick. You know, in in those days, many of your servants, you you lose one, you just go buy another. You just go get, I mean, he's just a Jewish guy. You know, it's no no big deal. He's He's a servant. No, you see this guy Caring about those he oversaw. Caring enough to act and, 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 and work on behalf of. And you see this, this humility in this guy. And you see this obedience to what he knew. Now, he didn't know all the New Testament scriptures. And, and, and probably, we don't know how long he had been a, a God-fearer, a, a Roman, who had followed the Old Testament. But we know this, that he had got the point. He cared about others, even those who worked for him or served him. You see this obedience. Finally, you see Jesus saying about this man, he's, his faith is amazing because he, he said, listen, this guy actually trusts me. He said, just say the word. I don't even need to see you do it. I don't even need to have you come into my house. He says, listen, I know I have men who are, uh, I oversee and, and I answer others. All you need to do is just say the word and it will be done. And he believed it. When Jesus said the word, he believed it. 
He had a trusting form of faith. Well, let me, let me just give you some passages that support this from around the rest of the scriptures. And so just join with me a little bit. Let's read a, a couple of passages about faith that uh, I think are important. I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. There's some other passages in scripture that tell us what faith looks like. And you see this all being lived out by the centurion. But let's just, let's just work you know, forward a little bit and then we'll go back. Notice what it says here in Hebrews chapter 11. This is called the faith chapter, the hall of faith chapter. And so Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So how important is faith to God? Well, we know Jesus thought it was important. As the rest of the scriptures are unfolded, it says you can't please God without faith. Yet your Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in God, right? Romans chapter Two, you're saved by grace through faith. Same word, believing, pistis, piste in the Greek. It means that we have, we have faith. It's impossible to please God, to be in relationship with God without faith. All right, so faith is super important, and Jesus highlights the centurion's faith. Now, I want you to, let's just jump over here now, and I want you to look at Romans chapter one, verse five. Romans chapter one, verse five. This is Paul writing to the Roman church, and he says something that is uh, in, in specifically about him, but it also applies to those of us today. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter one, verse five. Through him, through him, that's Christ, through him, we have received grace, and apostleship. Stop right there. So Paul is saying through Jesus, we have received grace. That means unmerited favor. For those of us who have believed in him, we have now been given undeserved favor. We deserved to be in hell because we'd fallen short of the glory of God. We deserved to be separated from God. It started at Adam and Eve in the garden, who, who did not believe God, did not put their trust in God, had to do it their own way. It spread to the whole world. The whole world kind of became this broken place of sin. Jesus comes into the dark world as light. He presents himself to us. The light comes to us. He invites us into the light. And he says, I'm giving you grace, but also apostleship. Here's what the, the word apostle means, one who is sent. To be an apostle means you've been sent. If you're an apostle of real life ministries, for instance, when we send out our missions teams, they are apostles, little a, apostles of real life ministries on a missions trip. If you're an apostle of Christ in the New Testament, it means that you were one of the 12 disciples who were then sent out, big A. You were one of the first 12. He's saying here, we have received grace, we've undeserved favor, and purpose. We are all people who have been sent. We are ambassadors of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 says. We've been reconciled to God and we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. He says, I've saved you from something for something. He says, how do we, how do we attain this or how, do we, how does this work? And he says this. He says, through him we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles, notice this, to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Now stop right there. Faith produces obedience. Notice that, let's, let's look at that verse again. To the obedience that comes from faith. Do you remember Jesus sent the disciples into the world? Go into the world, Matthew 28, 19. Go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. 
And lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. To the obedience that comes from faith. When you look at the centurion, you see a person that that probably started out not knowing anything about the Jewish God, but as time went on and he, and he started to become familiar with what God taught, you start to see a change in his behavior. And because he's being obedient to the truth that he's received, God keeps giving him more, all the way to the point where he understands that the whole of this Jewish religion is about this Messiah, the Lord. And so you see this person who's living a different life, and now we're told that, listen, if a a Roman centurion before Christ resurrected from the dead was changed by the Jewish faith that pointed to, the Jesus, to Jesus, how much more should we who are believers be changed after the fact because we know who the Savior is and what he's done for us? See, if there isn't growing obedience to the faith, Meaning we know what it says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know what it says. We're, 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 we're being called and, and we've received mercy and we have purpose and we're, we're learning to be obedient. Listen, then this kind of uh, whatever you want to believe, do whatever you want. I'm a Christian because I was born in a Christian nation. I don't know what country that is. Or I was uh, born because I went to a Christian family and I was baptized as a baby and all that. No, no, no. Hey, how do you know you have faith? Well, you have growing obedience to Jesus Christ. If you will not follow Jesus, you are not a disciple of Jesus. Well, faith, as you look through this, is uh, it's, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Real faith produces obedience. James 2 says, faith without works is dead, and he says that kind of faith can't save you. Real faith produces something. And, and, and listen, you're not doing what you're doing to earn salvation. You're doing what you're doing because salvation was granted to you. Because you, you received Christ and, and he, he received his mercy and now it's changing who you are. Well, one more verse that I want to look at. One more passage. It's in Romans chapter 4. Flip over there real quick. Verse 1. Now, Paul is making his case for salvation through Christ alone. And uh, in Romans 3, he's talking about we've all fallen short of the glory of God, both the Jews and the, the uh, Gentiles. Everybody has sinned and fallen short and deserves God's wrath. But now he's going to use an example of, of, of faith that saves both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so listen to what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say... That Abraham, our, uh, uh, excuse me, what, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Discovered in the matter of salvation. If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God. You can't boast about it. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now look at that verse again. I want you to look closely. Does it say that Abraham believed in God? No, it says Abraham believed God. He believed him. When God had come to Abraham and said, go into this land that I'm going to show you. I'm not going to tell you where. I'm just going to go and walk with you. Abraham believed him. God said, hey, I know you're old, but someday you're going to have a child. Abraham believed him. And believing him, in believing him, he was credited with righteousness. He was declared righteous because he believed God. Now, I, I want you to imagine, I've used this illustration many times before, but uh, I want you to imagine I'm out in the woods and, and uh, I'm lost and, and, and out of the woods comes this guy walking up out of nowhere and he says, hey, you're lost. Are you lost? And I'm a man. I'm an American. So I go, no, I'm not really lost. <laughs> but which way are you going? And I'm like, no, I'm lost. And he goes, well, I'm not going back that way. I'm still got further to go. But you see that mountain right over there? You're going to walk up to the top of that mountain. You're going to go over the top and there's a lake right there. And there's a road that goes right to the lake and that's your way out. 
Now, I believe the guy came and talked to me. I could, I could see him. But there's a difference between believing the guy came and talked to me, and, and he's right there, and believing him. Do I believe him? I might go, well, you know what? I don't want to climb that hill. Isn't there another way? Nope, that's the only way. Well, I just don't believe you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go this way over here, and I think I'm going to get over there. There's a difference between believing God and believing in God. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe in God or do you believe God? Believing in God, James 2 says that the devil believes in God. But he's not saved. Believing in God is different than believing God. So that means this. If, you've, if, if, if you're like, okay, I got to get my life in order before I can give my life to Jesus. Guess what? You're not believing God. Well, Jim, I, I, I'm not good enough. No, you're not. The, 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 the centurion didn't believe he was good enough. He didn't go, hey, because I've done this, this, and this, you know, I did this, and I did, I, I, I've earned the right for you to heal my, my servant. No, he said, listen, I'm not even worthy to come to your house. He believed God, what God had said in his word. And he came to this conclusion. Do you believe God or do you believe in him? When it comes to uh, uh, what God's word says about dating a non-Christian, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked with a non-believer. Did you know that when you choose to disobey what God clearly says, you believe in God, but you're not believing him? Well, that's hard though. I really want. Now, do you believe that every command God has ever given is for your good? Do you believe that he's proven himself to be a God who actually knows what he's talking about. When he warns us about something, like in the garden, if you give that fruit, you will surely die. And we didn't believe him, and what happened? I mean, what does he have to do to get us to the place where we're like, God, I'm gonna humbly trust that you are who you say. And as hard as it is, because I'm broken, I'm gonna put my trust in you for my salvation, and not just my salvation, that you died on the cross for me. I'm going to receive that. Proud people say, no, I have to earn it. I have to deserve it. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. That's why the Bible says pride is the worst of all sins because pride doesn't receive. It says, I'll earn. You can't earn it. You just have to receive it. And, and, and from now on, you understanding this, when you come walking brand new in your life, it's like, I'm not going to trust in my own understanding anymore, but in all my ways, I will acknowledge him. I'm going to lean not on my own understanding. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to walk in faith. The righteous walk in faith. Trust in God. As I close today, I want to ask you this question. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you said, okay, I'm, I'm ready? And it, it's a journey. You're starting a journey. And, and he doesn't tell you everything he's going to do. And, and that's faith too. Just to trust that he's good enough and he's been good enough and he is enough and he's going to keep his promises that I don't, there's going to be ups and downs and rights and lefts and I'm not always going to get it right because there's no such thing as perfect faith. Jesus had it. We don't. But I'm going to, the inclination of my heart is different. I'm going to follow Jesus. Today, we would love to see you receive Christ. We're going to take communion in a minute, but doggone it, you're not here by accident. Jesus loves you no matter what you've done. You're not worthy of his grace, but he wants to give it to you anyway. And then that changes everything. Please, why, do you, why are you waiting? Trust him. For those of you who are believers who are struggling with decision making that you know God's word says you ought to do one thing or another and you're like, no, I don't want to do that. It doesn't make any sense to me. Or you just go like, ah, la, la, I don't want to know what he says. I want to do what I want to do. I mean, I've done that. How many of you have ever done that? It's time to trust him. He loves you. He cares about you. We take communion together, we're reminded of what he did for us. Pray with me, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us examples in your scriptures of not guys who were perfect, certainly not. Only Jesus was. Thank you for him. But guys that showed us that we can trust, we can grow, we can be a part of what you're doing. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
challenge for us to respond to what God has been saying to us with our commitment to him. Maybe today you're in the room and you've not made that commitment, that step, that surrender that Jim talked about, saying I'm committing my whole life to you. We would love to know of those decisions in this time. Uh, you, could, you could text the word yes to the number on the screen. We love to hear about these, to pray about these, and to celebrate these decisions together. Maybe that decision is a recommitment or a decision to be baptized. Uh, you can let us know on that, on that text response. You'll get a response. But for all of us, we get to seek God and say, God, what do you want me to do with this? God's word never returns void. There's always a return for God's word as he convicts and challenges us as we seek him. And we're gonna spend the next few moments doing that, just talking with him, going back to the cross and the reminder of that sacrifice that it took to bring us back and restore us to relationship with himself. Let's spend a few minutes right now exactly where we're at, just praying and talking to God as we prepare our hearts to take communion. As we continue to pray, we're gonna spend a few minutes um, praying for the lost and the hurting right now and how God would reach them and use us to play a part in their story. Maybe today you're in the room and you're yourself hurting. You would seek God and talk with him and, and cry out to him. He's faithful to listen and respond. It's not by accident that you are here today. God knew and drew you here. That you would talk with him, meet with him, and have relationship with him. That's what he desires for you. Let's spend a few minutes right now praying for the lost and the hurting. As we prepare to take communion, I was just listening in on the message and, and reminded of this powerful story with uh, Jesus and this man with leprosy and the brokenness where he's drawing close to him. And we see this, this statement where he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus' response, he reached out his hand, he touched the man and he said, I am willing, be clean. And I love that picture. I think that's a powerful statement of the willingness of our God to restore us, to help us grow. And I think communion is a great picture of that too. That our God would go to whatever lengths it took, went to the cross, that he would send his son to restore us to relationship. That he was willing, that he was eager, that he wanted to 
bring us back that he wanted relationships so bad that he would send his son. And we see that all through the message of Jesus, this desire to bring back, to draw in, to point to the Father, that we needed that relationship, that we needed that hope, that wasn't, wasn't on our own, that we could bridge the relationship to God. We needed a savior, the truth, the life, the way, Jesus. That's why we pause and remember what he did for us, the cost he paid, and then our response to say, I'm willing, I surrender to you, God. We remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed in the upper room with his disciples that he took bread, he broke it, and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take that together. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant between God and man. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. I we're grateful for your willingness, your love that would pour out for us. You would send your son, that you would want to restore relationship, that you wanted relationship with us. And God, our response is surrender, our response is to worship and to trust you with everything we have. And we know we fail and we're gonna to continue to fail, God, but we, we want to and desire to draw close to you, be more like you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. We get a chance to respond right now in lifting our voices and declaring the, these truths we just heard with our own mouths. And to say, God, I do believe, I trust, I want to abide in you. Lots of ways you can respond. We're gonna have people up underneath the screens that would love to pray with you. What a great chance to take a step of faith of a decision that you made today. We're gonna have cards at all the exits. You can let us know of a decision that you made today in this service. Our service isn't over, right? We get a chance to respond to God's working, His power in our life, and to declare the things that we know to be true. Would you stand with me and let's worship.
And I don't want to do even one thing without you. And I know it's true, I can do nothing without you. And I don't want to do even one thing without you. And I know it's true. Merciful King, 
Come on. Our God deserves it all. All the praise, all the glory, and full surrender, right? Hey, we want to celebrate. Last week, we had 10 baptisms that we get to celebrate. Come on. Double digits. Celebration of life change. That surrender of all of it before people saying, I'm all in. I want to do what God has for me. Maybe that's the step of faith that you've been putting off and that you need to go public with your faith and to declare before others, God, I trust you. We'd love to talk with you after service about that. Come up front, we'd love to pray with you about that. Maybe it's to get connected in a small group. Maybe it's to serve, whatever that step of faith is, that God wants full surrender, a full life committed to Him, amen? Pray that we would take that step today. Let's pray as we close. God, thank you for what you've done today and what you're gonna continue to do as we leave this place. God, that there's a life committed and surrendered to you Amazing things take place because of the, the power of the Spirit that lives within us. God, praying for those that are still on the fence that haven't taken that step, they would come talk with someone. They would take that step of faith today. God, we're grateful for who you are and what you do in our lives. We declare it. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. Say hi to someone before you leave.